Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming in uh, the rainy day. Uh, so uh, I, I wanted to kind of keep it very informal and uh, really uh, brisk. Uh, and we want to, uh, we have a few uh, remarks by the panelists and we want to keep it interactive. Uh, before uh, I introduce the panelists, I just wanted to get a sense for um, uh, people in the audience uh, so the speakers can know where, uh, you know, how they pitch it. So how many of you are, uh, have done anything related to uh, technology broadly defined in terms of... Uh, Okay, so how many of you, uh, how about health? How about data? Okay, so there is a, there's a quite a bit of uh, overlap. Um, so uh, I want to introduce Sarah first. Uh, Sarah Ipen, uh, he's, uh, he's a vice president of science at um, Asian, a company and analytics platform. Uh, and she's basically a biostatistician and over 15 years of work. Um, and... Uh, she is, uh, you know, done work in the U.S., but also trying to start something in India. She's going to talk uh, about both of them. I have Shelly uh, Saxena, who's uh, introduced himself as uh, a startup, but in five years, I don't think, uh, you know, we should, we should uh, hold the startup uh, moniker for him. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of Seva Mob, which provides an AI-enabled uh, healthcare platform. Uh, to geographies in India, South Africa, and the U.S. Uh, he was also uh, a product manager at IBM um, and co-founded a mobile technology company. So he's used all his, uh, uh, you know, uh, experience in software and tries to trying to apply uh, in the area of health. Um, so I wanted to kind of start off uh, with with Sarah with, with more an informal question about, you know, how do you get into the space? Uh, just a little bit more background about. Uh, before you talk about your project? Um, so my background, I, uh, I have a graduate degree in statistics. Um, now I think it's very hip to, be, uh, to have some sort of training in data science. I did it at a time when it was not sexy, it was not cool. It was probably the worst thing you could do. Um, but what I have seen in my, uh, at least in this present field where we are right now, data is the next gold. So whether it is data coming from uh, social platforms or whether it is healthcare data, uh, understanding uh, the context of the data and then driving analytics and then ultimately actionable insights is the, is the next step. And so. At the moment, I know that uh, statistics as a field has evolved, certainly when I was a student to where it is now, where it's called data science, where a lot of the focus is about how do you deal with big data? Once you understand big data, how do you actually drive insights? What are the different tools? So at least in my, uh, in my realm, in my field, I have seen that uh, your your standard bachelor's programs or even your undergrad programs on some level touch on data, whether it is healthcare data, whether it is data from any other type of, um, I guess, any other type of field, you, you do encounter this notion of big data and how to deal with it and data warehousing. So I don't think you can escape it in a nutshell. Um, just want a follow-up question about uh, what we were talking earlier uh, many of you probably know about this randomized control trial now that's started off in uh, in healthcare. Now, any social sciences, uh, you know, RCTs are kind of the gold standard. Um, but your claim is that that seems to be there are other ways to uh, get at that. So, could yeah. you kind of clarify a little bit yeah. more about what the promise of the data is yeah. and what you can do without RCTs? Yep. So, uh, again, uh, my focus has been healthcare and primarily uh, around drug interventions. So pharmacy, um, looking at uh, particular types of drugs that work in subpopulations. And then therefore, what, are the, what is the evidence necessary to get a drug approved on the market? Everybody knows uh, the FDA ultimately is the regulatory body that uh, approves a particular drug. When I started out my studies and my career, uh, randomized clinical trials was, it was considered and is still considered the gold standard for driving evidence for, um, for approval. Uh, I'm assuming everybody here knows randomized clinical trials, great. Uh, 
around 10 years ago, I, so my training was in randomized clinical trials, designing them, analyzing them. Around 10 years ago, I pivoted and started to focus on real world data, again, in healthcare. Now, what is real world data? There are different types of real world data. Uh, in the US, you can think about claims data. So uh, data that is, um, uh, that is generated from, say, if I'm sick and I go to my uh, primary care doctor, uh, what happens during that visit? What are the tests? What are the uh, drugs that get prescribed to me gets captured? And that is called claims data. So that's one type of real world data. There is another type called EMR data. So everybody knows now in the US, uh, all hospital records are electronic. So every hospital has a warehouse uh, that captures uh, what happens to a particular patient at a time of hospitalization or an outpatient visit if it's an oncology center. That's another type of data. There are, there's a, the third type called registries, which are very specific uh, data warehouses that capture patients either that suffer a particular disease or they're on a particular drug. And then there are all your wearables and patient reported outcomes that come from you know, a particular app or say your Apple Watch that captures data around your uh, vital statistics and so on. This is all real world data. This is quite different from clinical trials, which is a controlled experiment. So when I pivoted to real world data about 10 years ago, I started to recognize that there is value in this data. It was garbage at that point in time because the technology hadn't evolved such that we could drive insights, uh, sort of meaningful insights like you would in a clinical trial. Over the course of certainly my career and more recently, uh, with Flatiron Health, which is an oncology data warehouse, my uh, current company, the technology has evolved where two things. One, you can take real world data. So whether it's claims or EMR, you can take it and curate it to a level that a regulatory body such as the FDA is willing to accept evidence about a drug. So that is a pivot, so, so much so that last year in December, the FDA came out with uh, an announcement saying that in addition to clinical trials, they're willing to accept evidence from real world data when it comes to drug approval. And this has only happened because of two things. One, the technology, and two, the analytics around the technology has evolved. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I want to... Uh, get to you in a second. Can I, uh, I ask Shelly to kind of introduce himself uh, and just briefly describe uh, what your startup, quote unquote, startup is doing? Sure. So uh, I'm Shelly from SaverMop, and uh, we provide AI-enabled healthcare platform to organizations in India, in Southern Africa, and in the US market. And we just signed a contract to enter the Central American market, primarily Guatemala and uh, Costa Rica and Nicaragua. And uh, our platform has three touch points. One is AI-based triage and point of care diagnostics for blood, vision, screen, urine, diet, and sputum. Second is uh, telehealth. And third is on-site pop-up clinics. And by putting the three elements together, we are able to offer comprehensive primary care at up to 50% lower cost. Care includes general health, vision, dental, nutrition, cardiometabolic, infectious disease, cancer, ENT, and more from a primary care perspective. What that means is uh, we are almost always the first touch point for several of these diseases. and. Uh, we do the consult, we do relevant point of care diagnostics, and then we do relevant treatment options uh, like there. So for example, uh, for vision, we do on-site consult plus screening for all types of conditions and then prescription glasses on-site. Um, for ENT, we do on-site consult plus hearing test plus hearing aids on-site. In dental, we do on-site scaling and caries removal and filling. In um, uh, cardiometabolic, we're doing on-site consults plus testing for cholesterol and uh, sugar and blood pressure and so on and then doing appropriate prescriptions or anything else like you know, on-site. So there is a very much a, a treatment element to it apart from the, all the tech involved like, you know, in the process. It's a B2B model. Uh, our customers are employers, their schools, their NGOs, their hospitals, their pharmaceuticals, their local governments. So all of them have some reason for using our services. And currently we are operating 163 full and part-time units across different geographies. The majority of these are sustainable. Uh, if you know primary healthcare, you know how difficult it is to um, sustain a, a clinic in different areas, but majority of our uh, units are sustainable. And uh, currently more than 86 organizations are paying for the use of our uh, services across these different geographies. 
just want to kind of a follow up question this is probably dated uh why i many maybe uh, 15 years ago or something um when i was uh doing early work in technology and what we can do with development in india uh there was a lot of excitement about uh, telemedicine which is basically saying you don't have doctors in in rural india as experts and so we want to be able to um address that problem by having remote uh doc- doctors or specialists far away uh and uh and telemedicine was 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 a kind of a popular uh, exciting thing but also you know except for a few places in urban high hospitals it didn't really take off in terms of the promise of what it could do because ultimately you needed doctors and you needed people to kind of follow up on and for people to trust a kind of a a computer looking thing where somebody else appears from far away was really hard to do so i'm i'm would be it'd be good to kind of try and see how what you're doing is different than the early efforts let me ask you guys a question if say you come go to a doctor with i have fever and the doctor is sitting at the other end of a laptop or a mobile phone right what is the doctor going to tell you based upon that like question not much there can be 50 to 100 different reasons why you have fever right so there needs to be something at the other end of that like you know with the patient um and that something needs to diagnose if you want to really have the full benefits of a telehealth platform if you don't have that end point at the other end with the patient then what you end up doing is you are just having a referral mechanism from telehealth a referral for lab services a referral for a specialist visit a referral for a hospital visit um so the difference in our model is um that's why i said the model has three touch points so we have on site pop up <coughs> clinics pop up clinic can be set up anywhere literally in 15 minutes or less it can be set up here right here right uh, in that we are doing all types of diagnostics ranging from um hiv syphilis malaria dengue typhoid cholesterol urine sugar hemoglobin hepatitis b hepatitis c vision odometry skin infections and so on right so that first of all helps us do rapid uh, uh, diagnosis of the issue at point of care right now the telehealth can come into picture and then whether the prescription or whatever needs to be done can be done but even that by itself has limitations so for example let's say the doctor just say like you know that uh, okay it is most likely malaria but if your pa- patient is sitting in a tribal belt in jharkhand the patient is not going to be able to do anything with that information right Where, because the nearest pharmacy is probably 2 hours from where the patient is so this is why in our model it includes all the elements combined so that we can achieve real health outcomes um, in a point of care setting thank you uh, so sir i have a sir i have a question about uh, ultimately uh, uh, how does ai help in in uh, reducing cost in 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 your uh, sure. in your work um so i have well uh, several examples uh, and then you can help supplement um i'll talk about a couple of use cases uh in the us uh which are applicable globally as well uh one of the things that is catching on and i because i'm more from the data and analytics perspective um is this concept of natural language processing so and what does that mean um again with data uh you can have data that is what i call structured which a doctor you know you pretty much when you go to a doctor here in the us you see that they're constantly on their screens filling in information that is what is called structured data but then there may be data that are in, that are in notes and so on um that is at the, at this time very difficult to bring into some sort of a structured format such you can such that you can analyze now what ai does uh what i call machine learning natural language processing is the ability to take data that sits in a pdf format or even in a written note and make convert that into a structured format such that then i can analyze that's one use case which is very very powerful at this point in time because a lot of information that we find and you probably also find is that data doesn't always get captured in the right format or in the right way and so when you look at the data on the back end and you're trying to <coughs> figure out say if this particular program is working there there are holes in the data because it's just not captured so that is one one use case of ai another use case of ai that i'm uh, intimately familiar with it's a it's a project that we're working on right now with medicaid with a state medicaid is um predicting members who are high cost or high risk so take any therapeutic area diabetes at the moment is a big um 
uh, is sort of a big uh, disease at the uh, or the cause for concern at this point in time. I think in the U.S. they have numbers like 40 percent is going to develop diabetes in the next couple of years, and therefore the care and the and it's a chronic disease, so the care and the cost of care is just going to increase. So one of the things uh, that most insurance companies, including Medicaid, Medicare, uh, their focus is trying to contain the cost of treating chronic disease, but also improving patient outcomes. Now, what AI can come in and where AI comes in is you, you've got these vast uh, quantities of data, big data. So take claims data, for example, where you're looking at millions of records. AI can come in and start to uh, sift through the data uh, to identify uh, members who are likely to become high cost, so therefore before the event happens. And that is through AI technology. However, again, and Shelley and I, we agree on this, uh, technology only gets you so far. You predict the members, but then what? That's when you still need the human component to come in where, okay, you say, this is the particular intervention that that member needs to be on and make sure that that intervention does get executed and then collect data on the back end to show the ROI. But uh, th does that suffice in terms no, of No, it's great. I, you know, I, I'll, I'll open it up to uh, Q&A very soon. But I had a question that I yep. asked you before, too. Uh, you know, this is a slightly philosophical one in the sense that now your AI is able to pr uh, predict things and, and help change history in, in, in hopefully good ways. Uh, but it also has uh, potential for uh, repercussions in terms of trying to control my behavior. Let's say, you know, I, let's say there's an AI uh, algorithm that figures out that I'm going to get diabetic, uh, you know, in, in, if I continue in a certain, certain diet. Uh, and, uh, and it also, since the question of cost comes in, the insurance basically says you need to go, go on a treadmill, you need to eat, uh, you know, watch your diet and tracks my ice cream uh, eating. Uh, yeah. And then finds out, actually, uh, not even waits for my self-reporting, finds out that I actually am on the side having some ice cream. Uh, and now it's uh, the question is, does it um, lead the insurance companies to stop my um, coverage? And, and, and as an example, uh, well, how, how are you think, how is the industry kind of thinking about uh, that repercussions where it's not here technology alone, but clearly an incentive structure that an insurance company could provide and want That's to change right. my behavior, but that uh, might lead me to not have coverage. And this is a very frivolous example, but can lead to, you can talk about a more yeah. serious example with the poor who yeah. might have a much more serious concern. So what would you respond? Yeah, no, I mean, that is definitely an example of uh, where right now everybody, it's all near term, right? Low hanging fruit, let's just get at the uh, reduction in costs and therefore better outcomes. But in the longer term, yes, using data informed, making data informed decisions, one thing does lead to this. It is sort of the, uh, what does an insurance company do when they can get the data about your behavior? And then do they then penalize you? I mean, I compare it to uh, driving, right? Like Geico or the, uh, what is it, Liberty? What are those insurance companies where they will dock you if you, uh, you know, drive fast or you've had more than two speeding tickets? And I think, yeah, we may head in that direction because, again, it is the fact that you are getting data. Without data, you can't act on it. But I do think that will happen. Uh, and I see it more as a data-driven uh, decision as opposed to something that's hypothetical. And at the end of the day, it is, our ch it is your choice. It is the patient's choice whether they want to break the speed limit or whether they want to go eat the ice cream. But I do think there are consequences to, to that, that at the moment there is no systematic way that is captured. If I'm able, I mean, I'm, I've always been a very uh, logical person. So if I'm shown that, okay, what, eating ice cream once a week, okay, you're not really going to have repercussions. But if you eat it every day, and this is what you're going to look like at the end of it, I would want to know. And I, and I would respect that that analysis because it is my own data that's showing me that. Um, so, but again, I'm a logical person and I think about things in, in, okay, if I do something today, it is gonna have consequences tomorrow and I can show it. But I suppose we're not there yet. I don't think people are using data in that, in that way. I think it'll come because there's so much data that's being collected now. Thanks, uh, I wanna open up to questions. Please introduce yourself and... 
Um, hi, my name is Malika. Um, I'm a sophomore in the School of Nursing and Health Studies, and uh, my question is to you. Uh, you mentioned a lot about primary care with the startup, and um, I was wondering how you could incorporate preventive care into this, and like screening facilities. I know you mentioned, I think, 163 units, and then how would you, um, after that, incorporate follow-up services? So, uh, great question. So, uh, as I mentioned, our model is a B2B model. Um, and preventive and wellness activities are a key part of that primary health care. And which is why we've been able to deliver outcomes ranging from up to 15% reduction in malnutrition, up to 30% reduction in, like, you know, uh, uh, dental issues in select groups, up to 25% reduction in vision issues in select groups, and so on. Um, and the way that happens is I'll give you one customer example. So, right now, we're working with uh, uh, Medtronic Foundation. Um, and uh, we have three in three states of India, where our local anchor tenants is a mine in Jharkhand. Uh, it's a microfinance company in uh, uh, Rajasthan, and it's a very large NGO in the state of Delhi and CR. There, we are using AI to predict your multivitamin mineral deficiencies and do a complete diet, exercise, and succession plan. Right, but that is just one element of it. From the wellness side, like you're mentioning. What we do is first raise awareness about why this matters, right? How this affects, um, let's say, during the pregnancy period, how this affects you as well as the uh, like health of your like and well-being of the child which is going to be born, right? What are the like issues which can like you know happen, right? So uh, the counseling and awareness generation and behavioral change is very much a part of our service, apart from just the tech around prediction of multivitamin mineral deficiencies and that plan creation. Does that that make sense? Uh, and this, yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Manpreet Anand. Um, my question is around um, the integrity of the analytics and the AI. I mean, we're all fascinated by the possibilities that AI presents for predictive reasons, for other reasons that you've all articulated, but it's all based on this idea that the, in, the integrity of, of both the algorithms and the data is so sound that we can start to make those types of decisions. And um, these algorithms in, are being created by various companies. It's all spread out. How do you uh, how do you evaluate the integrity of of that work? I mean, it is fundamental not to your own businesses, but also in this case to patient care. So, how do you feel confident that what you're actually bringing out is is true? Um, should I go first? Um, so in, there's one thing about uh, algorithms and data that uh, I cannot stress enough. I think about both of them as, let's say, fine wine. Everybody drinks wine, and they know that uh, there's good wine that gets better over time. Uh, what I've seen with data, and also data that we don't know and we've just started collecting, uh, it is very difficult to tease out trends. Those trends are going to evolve over time as the data evolves. So understanding that what the insights that you drive or the analytics that you drive today uh, will change as your data matures is key. So you have to always put whatever your insights are in context. So, so that's one. And the same thing with an algorithm. Uh, the algorithm is only as good as the data that feeds into it. So if your data are not mature enough, your algorithm. I mean, we've seen that like with, uh, for example, even with the Facebook uh, algorithms that were trying to vet out fake news and so on. Again, it's only as good as the input. So again, algorithms will also evolve over time. But coming to the second piece of how do you assess um, the impact, again, given the context, there are outcomes, there are near-term outcomes that you can assess. So for, for example, for one of my projects, it was looking at the uh, cost savings, the ROI. But again, it is in that context of a year where you say, okay, this is what we predict those cost savings to be. And can we actually get at that? Now, the cost savings in 12 months is going to be very different from, say, cost savings five years from now. But you can come up with outcomes such as those to assess the um, integrity or the validity of uh, both data and, uh, and these algorithms. So, um there is actually some data on this itself. Uh, so you're familiar with Gartner, right? Uh, so Gartner is one of the top tech uh, industry analysts in the world. Um, they did a, a 
survey of all the top healthcare CIOs, and they asked like, what uh, what do you want from a AI vendor so that you're comfortable with like you know their predictions and everything? And there is a, their answer was that um, it should not be a black box. The AI algorithm should tell you exactly why it is predicting something or telling something or like you know making whatever recommendations, right? Um, the company which you are advising, and like in your case, um, if that algorithm says that here is why this is a certain trend, this is why I'm predicting like you know so and so thing is going to happen to this patient, the uh, CIO is more likely going to use your technology, right? Um, so that was a big takeaway from there. Um, but I want to step back a little and say that uh, AI is actually much more than just the type of predictions that you mentioned or you've mentioned so far. Uh, we use AI in a very different context. So for example, uh, we use AI more for uh, figuring out if you, what your red blood cell count is, what your white blood cell count is, what your platelet counts are. We use AI to uh, screen for different types of anemia uh, by using deep learning. We use AI to screen for uh, diabetic retinopathy, cataract, glaucoma, ocular hypertension from your fundus images and extraocular images. We use AI to screen for TB in like the sputum samples. Um, we use AI, as I mentioned, to predict multivitamin mineral deficiencies and recommend a diet plan. In all these use cases, uh, there, there's an exact pattern that we are looking for. We document the pattern in our results. So when we say, for example, that we are saying that the li you have a likelihood of iron deficiency anemia, it says why we see, say that. Here is the sample. Here is what we detected in this sample. And this is the reason why we are saying that you're more likely to have iron deficiency anemia. That uh, case with all the case history and everything then goes to a specialist or like you know a physician at the back end right the physician can look at that entire case history and determine for himself or herself if the recommendations from the ai engine were valid or not so that increases the comfort factor that increases the um, the the quality overall of the like you know the intervention so i would say as much as you can make it transparent um, the better like the acceptability of that is going to be with data, and this is where, uh, uh, if you remember, I, I talked about using AI to bring in unstructured data into a structured format. Uh, the way that we validated it was indeed similar, where we, um, for a test group of patients, we used our algorithm, um, and then for a control group, we had doctors go back and look at the charts and validate our results. Uh, this in, in my field in healthcare is, is very, very important because uh, doctors, patients, providers, um, even insurance companies want the assurance that it is not a machine at the end of the day, even if it's a machine at the end of the day that's making the decision, it is still validated by a human. That we are still not comfortable with having a, a robot or, or some sort of a black box somewhere um, signing off on whatever it is that is being determined. You still want the human validation. Since the point of uh, that we're hosting, so one of the things, there's a, there's a strong movement to also try and regulate uh, and, and, and make the, uh, you know, algorithms, you know, more transparent. So it's like, you know, in the, in the sense there is a movement to kind of allow, uh, especially public service facing ones to have be under the FOIA kind of paradigm. So you can actually ask, uh, you know what algorithm has been used before, uh, and and so I think there, there's a movement. Uh, those of us here who who are interested in this kind of angle, is kind of worth thinking about. Uh, you know, furthering that and furthering that cause of how do you get some of these things uh, under public scrutiny. Um, Subramanian, I'm actually I'm in the medical campus. Yeah. Um, currently, um, we are doing a study combining the clinical and the data component uh, by looking at about 100 and different, 100 plus uh, different data points from a face. Uh, eventually, when it is validated, so somebody who is in a rural area or in somewhere in a village in Africa or India can take a picture through that app, and then the app will give the diagnosis, the probability of diagnosis. It's always not 100%, but there's a probability of the diagnosis. So if that is something that comes up as not that is urgent or emergent, they don't have to send them to the city or further out. They also know what the prognosis is, then you can look advice differently. So I think there is a great opportunity for combining 
these uh, data science and as well as in terms of the clinical science. Obviously, still the randomized clinical trials are very critical to be able to build, but this is something from the use itself, but uh, coming up, and I think Stanford and other places have created a large, you know, combined medical data science thing. So this is a great way to go, uh, but still have to. Yeah, no, it's very nascent, but it's uh, it is a it's nascent as in maybe the last five years or so. But it's exciting because it's moving. You know, we're moving away from. I don't think we can ever do without clinical trials. That's that's we're all. That's the fundamental piece, and I think. We shouldn't think that we can do away without it. Uh, but you don't, every uh, question doesn't have to be answered with a trial. And that is what is key. Uh, and I think the FDA recognized that uh, through their uh, statement last year. But there are also some diseases like polymyositis. The rare diseases, the rare exactly. Diseases, yeah. Very difficult to get randomized. Exactly. Like or the synthetic arm yeah. trials that they call, yeah, exactly. I'm Pinaki Panigrahe. I'm a pediatric infectious disease uh, person. I just had a comment, and uh, in fact, uh, I, I just want to touch upon two points. The one is uh, that, okay, AI has become, and data science has now become a fad, uh, and everybody has to do it, and we have, nobody knows how it's going to go. And the question was, how do we know that it's really doing, it's really predicting? Uh, I am part of, uh, within Gates Foundation, there is something called uh, HBGDK, Healthy Birth Growth and Knowledge Integration. So they use our data, like our clinical trial data. And I go, like personally, I do population health, where uh, we collect number of, uh, also how many times you're eating um, ice cream. At the same time, we ask the question, how many times your wife beat you up? Because those do have links. And then did you have a famine in the area? What, for how many... Uh, rainfall to temperature to all different things when we put all of them together then it becomes really massive data and uh, how to churn it and how to find the right result you never know but the the good news is we follow we something we call cohorts that we follow and we predict okay this infant is going to have this at the at uh, age four and then those are being followed it takes a lot of money at age four. If it happens, then we know that we have validated the model. If it doesn't, then we go back and ask the question, what uh, mistake did we, did the data scientists make? So it's evolving. Yeah, yeah, the concept of longitudinality of data is crucial because if you, wa if you want to try to ascertain trends or causality, uh, you need longitudinality. So what that means is you're following cohorts of patients over time and not a cross-sectional view of the data where you just take the data at one point in time, you can say very little. All you can do is describe that cohort, but in order to tease out why certain things happened, did they happen because of X, Y, and Z, uh, you, need to, you need to track them over time, to your point. And the second piece is, um, I don't believe today there's perfect data, healthcare data, but uh, in, because for every type of question that you need to answer, you realize, oh, I wish I had the EMR data plus their claims data plus I wish I could go back and ask them, to your point, did they eat ice cream every day or did they have, did they, uh, did they have some sort of um, personal adversity, which is patient reported outcomes. So to get a full, um, a full view of that particular patient's disease journey, you need uh, different types of data, and we're not there yet. Data is still in silos where we are. Uh, I have a question. Um, so recently, there's been like an increase in like awareness about like blockchain technology and distributed ledger technology. I just wanted to understand from like the panelist perspective, to what extent do you, do you see that integration within like health, and if so, like within which specific areas would you see to like cure inefficiencies that, you know, that distributed ledger technology could go, like, cure? Yeah. Uh, one of the use cases I've seen in blockchain is uh, just EHR, the entries, like, you know, naming a ledger for that. Um, that's and the most insurance, obvious. Insurance, yeah. insurance companies using it. Uh, Shari, quick question for you. Um, I know you do a lot of work on the ground, and I'm kind of going to pivot away from health tech to health and access to health. Um, what are your views on the implementation of the Ayushman Bharat scheme till date? And what have been some of the big wins and some of the big failures? Is it 
merely an election propaganda tool or has something good really come out of it? Since I'm in Georgetown, I can say that there is more hot air there than like, you know, the actual stuff on ground. Um, so first of all, in my opinion, uh, Ayushman Bharat is a rebranded RGBSY, which already existed. Um, the only difference in this, yeah. Uh, what is the full form of RGBSY? Uh, it was it was an actual um, uh, it was an old rural insurance scheme for people, where they could get hospitalization insurance, and I think the amount on that was one lakh to two lakh rupees. What Ayushman Bharat did was it increased the limit on that from two lakhs to five lakhs, right? Uh, you still uh, and I think that RGBSY was for uh, primarily for government hospitals. Um, there might have been some private like you no know, hospitals. I'm not sure about that. And so this has increased the number of like you no know, hospitals and stuff. The problem with Ayushman Bharat is it is providing funding for only five percent of the actual funding needs to cover everything that is promising to everybody. And this is official statistics. The second problem with Ayushman Bharat is it is only covering secondary and tertiary care. It is not covering preventive and primary. What they say is, well, you can go to the government primary healthcare centers and whatever, they're rebranding that too, right? There is a reason why there's a big health gap in primary care space in India. Those existing PHCs, they are understaffed, they're overcrowded, they're not like, you know, providing you the type of care that you need, right? So just providing insurance for the secondary, like, you know, uh, care does not actually solve the problem. It just solves one end to it. And then it's exacerbating a problem because uh, for almost all procedures, just like Medicaid in the US, it is trying to come up with the benchmark prices, right? Oftentimes, those prices are much lower than wh where they need to be. So for example, uh, as you guys already know, Narayan um, Hidale is one of the top like, you know, cardiology like, like you know, hospitals in India. And their rates are really low in how, in how inexpensively, how efficiently they can do, let's say, your like, heart surgeries, right? Um, their rates are higher than what Ayushman Bharat is like, you know, uh, funding for those procedures. So they, them, they even the lowest cost provider in India for those procedures needs to reduce his costs in order to like, you know, be at parity. So there's funding issues. There is like you know, the setting this like type of Medicaid type, like in Medicare type, uh, uh, that for this procedure you can only charge this much, and then uh, it, it does not cover preventive and primary care. So it's more of a rebranding rather than anything else. I want to end with one question. Uh, I wanted your thoughts on uh, what would you advise uh, for students uh, and others, I guess, who want to kind of get into the space uh, and what should we uh, be focused on? What should we train ourselves uh, in? Uh, any any thoughts on uh, this is such an exciting topic, uh, you, know, pr you know, both using AI and solving such fundamental health issues. So what would be your first thoughts and what how one should uh, prepare themselves we are i mean if we're all sort of in in this setting uh i'm sure the university offers data science cl uh, classes um I, I i took some coding classes just because i can't you can't get away from it um i th those are the first two i mean don't shy away from it i Statistics 101 was my time, and it has evolved. I, I don't think it is, I mean, they may have classes like that now, but uh, I think the, the nature, the content has evolved over time that uh, it is much more compelling. It's more interesting to get into that. Um, the second is uh, in terms of, uh, I think if, if it's outside the university setting, I feel that, you know, like General Assembly, all of these types of online courses are equally uh, equally good but um, I, I mean I at, in today's day and age I just think it's much it's very difficult to stay away from data or even some sort of analytics I, I think people need to understand uh, data but not just data for the sake of it but the context and the quality and so on um, I would just add that uh, in healthcare the problem is not that there is uh, not enough technology available the problem is more of how the technology can be applied, especially in like you know the last mile settings, and how the access to care uh, be increased. The cost can only be reduced if you look at the overall picture of access as well as the tech to like you know, enable that access or to make it cheaper to like you know, deliver care. Uh, so uh, if you are a student and you're looking at like you know where to apply your skill set, um, just the algorithms and the 
medical devices which are based upon AI is just one element of it. Access to a care is a big, big area and half the world's population does not have access to like, you know, leave aside secondary care, not even primary health care. So if you can come up with like cool models for enabling that access, then uh, th that's like, you know, uh, praise be to you. And then third thing is that uh, funding of care is also an innovation, uh, is ripe for innovation. So for example, there are a lot of micro insurance models. Um, if you guys want to check out, check out this company called MicroInsure. Um, and same way in um, Bangladesh, and there is um, a company called Telenor, uh, which is like pro providing some innovative funding side, in, like you know, models. Uh, so look at the big picture. Does the tech is the cool part of it, but it's just one part of it. In healthcare, access to care and funding of care is as important as the tech aspects. Thank you for both your advice, and let's uh, thank the speakers for, uh, for a very good introduction to the subject.